Ecclesiastes chapter 3 verse 1 it says, To everything there is a season, a time for every purpose under heaven. Let's pray before we get started. Kind and gracious Heavenly Father, I pray that you'd be with me as I stand before your congregation tonight. Lord, I pray that you'd use me as a vessel in your hand. I pray, Lord, that I can be your mouthpiece to speak to the hearts of the people this, morning, this evening. And Lord, I pray that we can all glean things that will help us. And Lord, I pray as I always do with a sincere heart, Lord, that if there's anybody that's lost that hears this message, Lord, you'd speak to their hearts and show them their great need that they have. Show them that they can't have salvation through Christ Jesus no matter how far they've gone out into the world. And Lord, I pray too for us who are born again, help us to realize that this time we live in is your time. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So I've titled the sermon tonight, His Time. Or I thought about titling the sermon, His, His Story. And I remember many years ago, somebody said, history is actually His story. And I said, Amen to that. And that's altogether true. But the Bible speaks of various different times on God's timetable. And we'll read some of those in Romans chapter 15 verse 4. It says, Whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. So it talks about aforetime. And we're going to preach on that. And then in Galatians 4 4 it says, But when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth His Son made of woman, made under the law. That is the fullness of time. And of course we'll touch on that also. In 2 Timothy 3.1 it says, of This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. There's another portion or another stop in His story. Another stop in His time. So we'll talk about perilous times. And then lastly, in Job chapter 19, verse 25, Job says, For I know that my Redeemer liveth, and that he shall stand in the latter day upon the earth. So there is the last stop in God's timetable, and one that will last forever and ever and ever. So I'm looking forward to that latter day when Jesus walks upon the earth. It's his time. Now, let's start out with that first one I mentioned. A four time. Let me read it to you again. For whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. What was written aforetime? Now when I think about it, I think about what Paul's talking about there. The New Testament hadn't been penned down yet. He's talking about the Old Testament. He's talking about what the prophets said back there many, many years ago. And if we're going to start talking about the prophets, let's talk about one of the primary prophets, Moses. Moses, God used him to write down what happened in the beginning. Moses was not there. Moses was not born. He did not know Adam. But God inspired him to write what happened in the beginning. And he wrote, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now you'll notice there, there's no question mark when it said God created the heavens and the earth. There is a period. He did it. There's no debate about it. There's no defense that has to be made. God created the heavens and the earth. It's only proclaimed. A four time God made everything that was made. And we touched on that much this morning. So I'll not walk down that same trail tonight. But don't you believe that everything came from an explosion of nothing? If you believe that, uh, you are a fool. Amen. After all, does the Bible call you a fool? It says, the fool is said in his heart, there is no God. It's a lot easier to believe that God made everything than nothing made everything. But anyways, aforetime we learn how everything got here. I don't have to talk to some philosopher. I do not have to go get some textbook. I just know what God says. And aforetime he taught me that he made everything. Now that's one of the great battlefields of today and we need to stand in that battle. But anyways, uh, we learn from the Word of God that on the sixth day that God made man in His own image. Mark that down. Man was made in God's image. And i got news for you. God is not a paramecium. 
God is not uh, one cell organism. God is not a monkey. God made Adam in his own image and he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. God's the one who gave life to him. God's the one who made him different than the animals. And we're not the same as animals, friends. I mean, in the school systems, they will tell our kids that they are just another animal. We're not an animal. We were made in the very image of the Almighty. He shaped Adam from the dust of the earth. And then when Adam named all the animals in a language... Not in grunts. He named all the animals. He noticed there was a male and female of every one. But there was no help meet for him. No one suitable for him. So God put him asleep and performed the first surgery. And out of his rib, he shaped the woman. And I like where she came from. She came out of his side because she was to be at his side. To be a help meet for him. Amen. Not from his foot that she would be walked over. Huh? Not from his head that he would be a lord over her, although the man is the, the head of the house, but uh, not to be uh, treated as a servant, but to be by the side. To compliment. Amen? But we know the story. Eve was tempted by the devil. The Bible says that she was tricked or she was beguiled. The Bible says the man was in the transgression. Do you get to hear that? I hear all the time people blaming Eve. But Eve was not in the transgression. She was deceived, the Bible says. But Adam took the fruit willingly and with his eyes open. And I can tell you this, uh, Adam is a type of the Lord Jesus Christ. And in that type we find that he took of that fruit uh, that he could be with his bride. She was deceived and separated from him. Uh, but uh, his love was so strong for her that he willingly broke the law of God to be with his bride. He took that sin. And I love that picture because that's what Christ Jesus did. He wanted to be with his bride. And to be with his bride, he had to bear our sins in his own body. He had to willingly take on the sin of the world. I find that a wonderful picture in the word of God. After all, Adam is, uh, Jesus is called the last Adam. Why is that? Because the first one pictured him. Now, man takes of that forbidden fruit. And we find him there uh, hiding from God. Him and Eve have gotten together and schemed how to, cl to clothe themselves. How to make things alright. They sew up fig leaves and cover up uh, the, their nudity. And they hide in the trees from God. Because God said, the day you eat of that fruit, you're going to die. And I tell you what, terror probably came into their hearts when the cry came, Where art thou? Amen. Wouldn't you be afraid? But they tried to hide from God, but you can't hide from God. God knows exactly where you are, and God knew where Adam and Eve was, but He came not in wrath, He came in, in mercy. He came offering them a promise that one day a Redeemer would come and redeem all of mankind. One would come who would crush the head of the serpent. And although he bruised his heel, he would crush that serpent into the dust. He made them coats of skins. I like that. We see a perfect picture of things as we learn aforetime that man has always tried to cover their own nakedness or cover their own sin. But it never does get the job done. The only covering that is suitable is that covering that comes from God. The coats of skins covered them. The fig leaves did not. The fig leaves were the works of their hands. But God's covering that He gave was a good covering. It was a covering that worked. And likewise it is with salvation. You can try to cover your sins with your own works of your own hands. And think about those leaves. They came from a cursed earth. From a cursed tree, they could not cover them, but only what was done by God would cover them. And that's the way it is. Your sins will never be washed away by your good works. They can only be washed away by the blood of the Lamb. Amen. But I see them there. They're playing the blame game. Uh, uh, God, first of all, talks to, to Eve. Or to Adam, I mean. God talks to Adam and, and, and asks him about it. And Adam says, it was that woman you gave me. Huh? And then God talks to the woman. And you know what the woman does? It was that old serpent. 
Huh? Everybody wants to blame somebody else. Isn't that the way it is today too? Nobody want to take, wants to take responsibility. Nobody wants accountability. I mean when it comes down to sin, everybody always wants to talk about everybody else's sin. What you need to do is confront the sin that is upon you and seek forgiveness through the one who can give it, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. You see, when Adam and Eve sinned, death passed upon all men. From generation unto generation, this sin nature is passed upon men and we're prone to sin. The old nature pulls us away from God. And because we, because of our forefathers' sin, they died spiritually that day, although their mortal, physical lives continued on. But that mortal physical life also uh, uh, died uh, over time and began dying. I believe if Adam and Eve hadn't taken that fruit, they would have lived forever. They would have had perfect bodies. But when they took of that fruit, their bodies began to fail like and wear out like an old tent. But God made some uh, proclamations. He told the serpent that he'd have to eat dust. I find that very interesting. It doesn't say the snake. It says the serpent. And then it, it talks like it probably had legs because God cursed it to crawl on its belly. So evidently it didn't do that before. But uh, the promise was made that its head would be crushed. The woman was promised a pain in childbirth and to be subject to her husband. The man, was uh, his ground was cursed for his own good. Now I find that very interesting, don't you? In the garden, the earth yielded abundantly. After Adam sinned, the earth was cursed and it didn't bring forth bountifully. So man would have to work all the time. I think work's good for a man. Say amen. amen. A man that just sits around and does nothing is a man who's going to get into trouble. Amen. amen. It's a man who don't feel no worth. Amen. You agree with me? Amen. A lot of people sitting around. The Bible says if you don't work, you shouldn't eat. Now I know there's crippled folks and people who may not be able to. But if you have an able body, you ought to get out there and put in a, a your time. Amen. That's the Bible. There's an old saying. Idle hands are the devil's workshop. I believe that. But anyways. Death was by far the worst result though of this fall. In Romans chapter 5 verse 12 it says, Wherefore is by one man, that's Adam. Sin entered into the world, and death by sin. So death passed upon all men, for all have sinned. It all started with that one man, Adam. This passed upon everybody. That's what we learn a full, full a four time. The death passed on everybody. Uh, we're in trouble. We're going to die. But aren't you so glad that Jesus came and offered life? Jesus came and said, if you believe in me, you will never die. He comes into those who are dead in their trespasses and sins and He quickens us by the power of God and He makes us alive spiritually. And we'll never die again spiritually. According to the words of Jesus. God taught us aforetime by pictures. He taught us by promises and He taught us by prophecies and by precedents. Now, let's talk about those for a few times. Uh, Hebrews chapter 1 verse 1 says, God who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake in time past to the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken to us by His Son. In the, in the former times, at sundry times, He taught by prophets in various ways. And He did that through pictures a lot of times. Or what, we, what I call types. What it is is you'll read a story in the Old Testament. And it's actual history. It actually happened. Uh, but God also painted a picture with those events of His Son coming. For instance, the coats of skins certainly are a picture of Christ. Adam and Eve tried to cover their nakedness with the works of their hands. Uh, but God covered them with coats of skin. Before coats of skins to be used to cover them, what had to happen? Something had to die, right? Right? Christ had to die to make the coats of skins uh, that we now wear as Christ's righteousness imputed to us. Abel's sacrifice. 
is certainly a great picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. Remember Cain uh, brought uh, for an offering to God uh, works, his own works, his own things that he had grown from the cursed earth. And he said, here you go God, this is my sacrifice to you. And God said, no, I won't have it. And he told Cain, he said, if you do it right, I'll accept it. Just do it right. But no, he wouldn't do it right. Even though God gave him another chance, he refused. He went off on his own, away from God, into the land of Nod. And how many people today have heard God's way of salvation and said, I don't want none of it. I want to do it myself. I want to do it my way. But your way is not suitable in the eyes of God. Cain came with a blood sacrifice. Why did God accept that? Because that sacrifice was a picture, a type. Of Christ Jesus being slain for us. Right. We see Noah's Ark. And I love preaching on Noah's Ark. It's one of my favorite things. But we have Noah's Ark as a certainly a picture that God preached Christ in. I mean after all, there was only one door inside, wasn't there? Huh? One, one door inside of the Ark of Safety where they would be safe from the wrath of God. Well, I tell you this, Jesus says, I am the door. If any man enter in, he shall be saved. Huh? Jesus is that door on the ark. You go inside of that door, you're safe outside the waters, which is the wrath of God, fall. By the way, the whole boat is a picture of Jesus, really, because the wrath of God fell on Jesus, but we who are in Christ Jesus are safe from the wrath of God that's falling. See the picture? See the top? Everybody outside the ark perished. Everyone outside of Christ will perish. We have the Passover where the blood was applied to the doorposts and lentils. And though where the blood was applied, the firstborn was safe. That's a picture also of the blood of Jesus Christ. Where it is applied, there's safety. We see the Ark of the Covenant is a picture of Christ Jesus where the blood was sprinkled on the mercy seat. Where the blood is applied, there's safety. Inside of that ark was a golden pot of manna, Aaron's rod that budded, and the broken tablets of the law. We see that Jesus is that manna that's come down from heaven, the bread from heaven. If you'll eat it, you'll live forever. Jesus said, I'm the bread. Aaron's rod that budded a cold stick, a dead stick, uh, that when it was set in the tabernacle, it began to blossom and bloom and grow almonds on it. That was Jesus. He was dead for our sins, uh, but He rose from the dead and is alive forevermore. Amen. And then the blood covering the law. What a wonderful picture we have in the Ark of the Covenant. I could go on and on with this. Jesus, the Word of God says, Lo, I come in the volume of the book. It is written of me. It's all written of Christ. There is a, a scarlet thread that runs from Genesis to Revelation. The Lord Jesus Christ is the theme of the whole book. A time God wrote of Him. He made promises uh, that foretold the coming of Jesus. Uh, that uh, when God came to Abraham, made Him promise, said, I'll make you a great nation. And God did make Him a great nation. His seed would be as the sands of the seashore or as the stars in the heaven. He said, I'll give you a land. If your people do well, they'll dwell in the land. If not, they won't dwell in the land. And they let dwell in the land until they didn't do good and God put them out of it. But one of the promises that extended to all generations was this promise made to Abraham. He said, through you all nations of the earth shall be blessed. Huh? Through thy seed. Who is that seed? That seed is singular. One seed. The Lord Jesus Christ. Through Him all nations of the earth would be blessed. When that happened, David in the promises of God was promised that he would have a kingly line that would never cease. An everlasting throne which pointed back to the theocracy where Jesus Christ would reign eternally. Amen. A foretime we're taught a king's coming. Psalm 2, I've referenced it time and time again. Kiss the son, uh, lest he be angry. The king is coming. A four time. God called a nation, taught by the law, but that nation fell short because no one can live up to the law. Israel was prepared for the coming of the Messiah in their failure. They should have seen that they needed a Savior to die for their sins. Although they failed, 
God said, I'll not make a full end. I like that. He said, I will turn again their captivity. I will make a new covenant with them. And God is not done with the nation of Israel. Amen. And neither will it be done with His people in faith either. He'll not turn us away forever either. So God promises a sacrifice and a sovereign. But aforetime He also teaches by prophecy. He taught the first coming saying the seed of the woman would crush the head of the serpent. We already talked about that. But the seed of the woman, what a, what a, what a strange phraseology that is. I mean, any one of us with any age on us knows where the seed of life comes from. It comes from the man, does it not? But here it says, the seed of the woman. What does that mean? It means man was going to have nothing to do with it. And we know when Jesus came, man had nothing to do with it. Jesus was conceived as the Holy Ghost overshadowed Mary. And He was born of a virgin. The virgin birth is taught in Genesis 3.15. What an amazing thing. There's a fancy term for that if you can remember it. The proto the first promise. I thought Bub would appreciate that big word. It was prophesied that he would ride in on a donkey. So you know what Jesus did? He said, go loose that donkey. I'm riding into town on it. The Bible said I'm going to do it, and I'm going to do it. And by the way, when he says in Revelation he's going to come back on a white horse, since he went through all the trouble riding a donkey, you think he ain't going to ride on a white horse? Amen. The sacrifice that's all pointed to Jesus. The Passover pointed to Jesus. And finally, John, there in the New Testament, he says, Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. He surely paid attention to what God taught aforetime. Aforetime. I think about Luke chapter 22, verse 53. It's when, when Jesus looks at the world and said, This is your hour in the power of darkness. This was their time, but that hour was going to end and Christ's time is going to, going to come where He sits down and reigns. But anyways, think about a time. Now, a time we know uh, that Jesus would come and He did come. And He came in the, in the perfect time and we'll talk about that here in a little bit. But anyways, let's get to the next one. I could keep on preaching. We're already way in. Let's talk about the last days. Now, the last days, I believe, started with Jesus Coming the first time. I believe the last days have been running for quite some time. At least 2,000 years. But I think we're getting to the last part of the last days. I mean, listen to what it says in 2 Timothy 3, 1. It says, This know that in the last days perilous times shall come. Now for Christians in the first century, it was very perilous times. I mean, they were being fed to lions. They were being tortured and killed. It was perilous times then. But I tell you what, we're once again entering into those perilous times here in the last part of the last days. I mean, 1 Timothy 4.1 kind of sounds like a newspaper article to me. It says, The Spirit speaketh expressly in the latter days, some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. The Bible says, in the last days perilous times shall come. Men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents. Huh? Doesn't that sound like today? We're living in the last days. Jesus is about to come. So since Jesus is about to come and we're in the last days, we all just strike at it with everything we have. There's a night coming when no man can work. Let's do all we can before uh, the Lord comes in the clouds. We're living in the church age. It's a time of reaping. A time of preaching and gathering together. Let's gather together all we can. The Bible says, He that goeth forth weeping and bearing precious seeds shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. Let's bring him the sheaves. Because one of these days, the Lord's going to come in the clouds and the rapture's going to take place. Let's be ready for Him. Now, in the last days, I believe, extend on past the rapture of the church or the, or the uh, second coming, whatever you want to call it. There's a time uh, when uh, uh, the uh, great tribulation period will start. That's a seven-year period. 
That's going to be the worst time it's ever been on the face of the earth. There's going to be a guy step on the scene called the Antichrist. He's going to work miracles. He's going to seem to have been killed, but he's going to seem to raise from the dead. He's an imitator. The first seal when it's broken describes him as being a rider upon a white horse with a bow in his hand and a, and a crown on his brow going forth to conquer, not with his arrows, but with his bow, with diplomacy. He's going to be a, a man who seems to know everything and have all the answers. I said seems to. The world's going to follow after him, but he's a false Christ. The true Christ has already come and taken his church. The true, true Christ will come seven years later with the armies of heaven and will reign forevermore. He's going to have a, a false prophet. There's going to be one who does spectacular miracles. The second beast uh, that comes uh, from the sea. And he's going to do great miracles and he's always going to point towards the Antichrist. What you have is an unholy trinity there. You have the dragon, which would be a, a, a false a God the Father. You have uh, the Antichrist, which is a false Jesus. And you have the false prophet, which is a false Holy Spirit. We have an unholy trinity. And the, the false prophet is like the Holy Spirit. As the Holy Spirit points to Jesus, the false prophet points to the Antichrist. But you know what? They'll have their time. Do you know what's going to happen to the old Antichrist and the false prophet? They're going to be cast into the lake of fire. There in the last days, He's going to gather together an army after the seven year tribulation period. He's going to march against uh, the Lord and against His people. And Jesus is going to come back and destroy Him with the brightness of His coming. Amen. He's going to be cast in the lake of fire where the Bible says the smoke of His torment will ascend up forever and ever and ever. There's coming a war, folks. Which side are you going to be on? Huh? Are you going to be a part of those saints coming back with Him? Or are you going to be left behind? Will you suffer? Or will you glory? It all depends what you do with Christ right now. But let's talk about that last division here. And although I could preach on this for a long time, let's get to that last division. The latter day. What's the latter day? Has nothing to do with the LDS church. They call themselves the church of the latter day saints. I, they don't follow the Bible and their Jesus is not the Jesus of the Bible. But our Jesus, our true and living God will come back and His feet will stand on the earth in the latter days. Listen to what Job said. Job 19.25 it says, For I know See that? I know. I'm not, it's not saying, I guess, I think. No, he says, I know that my Redeemer liveth and that he shall stand at the latter day upon the earth. Amen. He's going to stand on the earth. Now, I know we did 2,000 years ago, but he's going to stand there again. Zechariah in Zechariah 14 says that the mountain, all of it, will cleave asunder when he stands upon it. He will stand upon it. And the Bible says He'll make uh, that, that place the place of the soles of His feet when He comes again. Revelation 19, I, I, I read it this morning, I'll not read it again, but when He comes down, He comes down in power and glory. And the Bible says that He crushes His enemies in so much as the blood flows to the horse's bridle. He'll set up a kingdom. He will reign a thousand years according to Revelation 20. That's exactly what it says. He'll reign during that millennial reign. The devil will be bound during that time. And I'm going to laugh at him. Amen. Lord will let me. I'm going to go and kick him a few times. But he's going to be bound in a bottomless pit. The king will take the throne. He'll be a healer. He'll rule with a rod of iron. The lion will lay down with the lamb. The child will play on the cockatrice's nest. All will be at peace. But then the devil's loose for a season. He preys upon those of the old nature still. Not, not the redeemed, but those who are unredeemed. And he gathers together an army to come against God one more time. Revelation chapter 19 and 20. Read it for yourself. 
And God, instead of mounting back up on his white steed, you know what he does? He calls down fire from heaven and devours them. And then a new thing starts to take place. Heaven and earth flee away. There's no place found for them, the Bible says. And there's a great, great white throne set up. The second resurrection takes place and the dead all are resurrected from hell itself. And they stand before God and God judges them according to their works. And when their names are not found written in the book of life, they're cast in the lake of fire where the beast and the false prophet are. And there they are forever. What a terrible end. I pray that you not be in that number of the dead. I pray that you, uh, that you come to the Savior while you can. The Bible speaks of that place where the beast and the false prophet are. It's called the second death in Revelation chapter 20. But it says the smoke of their torment is sent up forever and ever. The lake of fire. But you know what? That's not the end for the saints of God. Saints of God got something better. In that latter day, the Bible says that God makes a new heaven and new earth. Amen. Amen. The former things are done away with. You say, what are the former things, preacher? I'm talking about sickness, pain, sorrow, death. Those are former things. They're done away with. They're never more known again. I was talking to uh, Sister Misty here. Uh, they're going to, to Africa here pretty soon. And I said, hopefully you got all your sickness over with. Uh, and out of the way so you'll be healthy when you go over there. But I tell you what, all that sickness and stuff will really be over and done with in the new heaven and new yeah. earth. The Bible says He's going to make all things new. What man hath ruined in the beginning, God is going to, to remake. You know, we talk about how wonderful the world is. Remember the old Louis Armstrong song? What a wonderful world. <laughs> a pretty good Louis Armstrong impression, huh? But I tell you, this earth is nothing like it was when God first made it. Before the curse, I mean, it was a spectacular place. Man has ruined it, and we've ruined it even more as the years have progressed. But God's going to make it all new one of these days. It's going to be perfect. Amen. You know what makes a perfect earth? I mean, you don't have to drive very far before you see a cemetery, do you? There will not be a single headstone upon the face of the earth in that new heaven and new earth. You'll not have to drive past the hospital. There won't be any hospitals. There'll be no jails. I like to preach that sermon in jail and see what the people say. No jails. It's going to be perfect. If you're born again, you get to live in that in the latter days. And the Bible says that New Jerusalem, that city that God went to prepare for us in John chapter 14, Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you, the place where the saints of God have been. It's going to come down from heaven. Now I used to think the Bible said it's set up on the breath of the earth and, and me and dad was talking about it. I said, I don't think it really says that. I've always thought that, but it don't say that. I, I mean, it, it may sit above the earth or it may sit on the earth. I don't know. But anyways, it's going to be a spectacular thing. going to be able to go to and fro to it. You know, New Jerusalem, I, I, I studied it one time and, and I worked out all the measurements. And I used to know exactly how big it was, but uh, I, I can tell you closely about what it is now, if I can remember it goes from like uh, Maine and those northern states. Uh, well, it would go all the way down to the tip of Florida. And then it would go all the way out west about where Colorado is. That's how big New Jerusalem is. And then it's just as tall as it is big on the bottom. It's a cube. That's going to be our home forevermore. The Bible says Jesus is going to reign forever after that. Are you going to be a part of that reign? If you are, you're going to have to be saved. I, I heard one preacher, he was preaching on the, the millennial reign of Christ. And after it was over, somebody looked at him and said, I, I can't believe this is going to reign for a thousand years. No, I don't mean rain like falling from heaven. He's going to be on the throne for a thousand years. And he's going to be on the throne forever after that. And I can promise you that because it's written right here. Let's pray.